Welcome to the stars in the making with the mission to inspire and frame the future. Let's talk entrepreneurialism, a collab between Mass Bay and Stars in the Making podcast. On this episode, you will learn how to deal with failure and overcome it as an entrepreneur, some with more experience than others. As iron sharpens iron, we make each other better. Number one, Arif Bimani. Senior Vice President Commercial Lending, Middlesex Savings Bank, Business Banking Group. Number two, Fiona Kikoyo, founder of the brand Fiona, impeccable decor solutions, sold over 100,000 pillows. Fiona presented her creation in prestigious venues such as Nordstrom, West Elm, Boston Women's Market, Boston Black Owned Businesses, and so on. Number three, Ricardo Golo, business owner and founder of the Stars in the Making podcast with the aim to inspire and using stories for someone's survival guide. Number four, Nicola Webb, business owner and founder of One Vision Studio. She coaches visionaries in the craft of brand storytelling through video production with the goal to uplift others through creative content. Number five, Gordon Weinstein, business owner and life coach with diverse experience and challenges to build a business model that not only strives, but provides a unique, valuable experience for its customers. Number six, Signe Jones, business owner and founder of SLJ Consultant, aimed to work with small business owners with an emphasis on women-owned companies and help to build their current systems. Please welcome on the second episode of Creating Leaders. Question number one, what initially drew you to entrepreneurship and how did you discover your passion? So as I mentioned, I started my professional career here at Mass Bay and I was in higher education for over a decade. Don't do the math, um, but over a decade. And then I was like, you know what? I work really hard. I work long hours and I just don't feel the benefit of it. And so just by happen chance, um, somebody who works in mortgages, so you'll understand this, um, came or came into my path and he was looking for somebody to join his team as a mortgage advisor or helping support him as a mortgage advisor. And so I just took the leap. I was a bio major and then I worked in higher education. I got like my skill sets and my passions with math and also helping people kind of evolved into mortgages but then I quickly realized that that wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't my passion. You know, it's one thing to develop a relationship with somebody, but then they leave you because they found a better rate. And I was like, well, this just doesn't feel nice. And um, I felt like there was just a lot of sliminess in real estate. So I apologize if anybody's in real estate, but it just felt really slimy. And not like those that know me know that I'm a relationship builder and I'm not looking for something from somebody um, in exchange. Um, And so I actually sat down with one of my other entrepreneurial friends and she was like, well, what excites you? What makes you happy? And I said, order makes me happy. Like seeing things work smoothly and efficiently, that makes me happy. It's a little bit of a nerdy side. I understand that, but, um, but that's really what makes me happy. And I have found that I'm working with a lot of creative types who hate processes and hate order and they just want to be able to go do their thing. And so I'm the perfect counterpart to them. Um, and so that's kind of what, and again, you're in charge of your own time. You're in charge of your own life in many ways, your hours. You know, my mom had to be admitted to the hospital a month ago and I was able to just go take care of her and not have to worry about anything. Whereas my other brother had to, you know, check with his boss, make sure it was okay for him to take time off. And I was like, I don't ever want to have that life again. I just want to be in charge of my own time. And if I work hard, it'll pay off. So yeah. Actually. And the best. <laughs> Snapping the fingers. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Make uh, us feel good. <laughs> so the biggest thing that drew me to entrepreneurship was a lot of family members I have have their own businesses. And happily, they were successful. Some of them were unsuccessful. And I realized the life that you can have if you're an entrepreneur compared to if you're working a nine to five, right? 
in the corporate world getting getting paid enough where you can travel the world, you can have a luxurious lifestyle, it takes quite a bit of effort and energy to really climb the ladder. So instead of putting that energy and effort into someone else's business, why not put it into mine? Now, trying to figure out what I liked, that was the long shot on every single level, as everyone here can <laughs> probably attest to. Uh, that was trial and error. Um, I knew I liked helping people. I had no idea what. Um, life coaching didn't actually come up till about three, four years ago. The main thing was I love helping people. How can I help them best as possible? And then I found an avenue where I can make a decent amount of money. And I was like, you know what? Let's try this out. Um, and it clicked. And here we are. Seven years later, I'm sitting up here in a panel. Let's go. There we go. Hey. What's <laughs> up? So, all the snaps <laughs> and the class. <laughs> uh, well, my story is a little bit um, different. Uh, what got me into entrepreneurship was uh, growing up where my dad was an entrepreneur. He does AC, con um, air conditioning, plumbing and heating and so forth. And I remember like in fifth grade, he would pick me up from school and he paid me like $100 to pass him a tool. So I was like, this is pretty cool. <laughs> And of course, $100 at like nine years old feels absolutely amazing. Um, but I did not go into entrepreneurship because of that. To be honest, I started off where um, I was pretty set that I was going to be a cop. Um, I pretty much thought that my trajectory was going to end up being like Law and Order, Olivia Benson. <laughs> like I was set, like that was it. And then I studied criminal justice and I went to um, Nashua Street and I realized this is not for me. I was way too emotional. I was too invested. And I realized you have to have more of a stoic personality to be in criminal justice. But long story short, um, I got into entrepreneurship because of an injury. Um, I had a major injury that shifted the trajectory of how I had planned out my life. And for all of us that are on this panel and in the audience, we know that you could plan your life out to a T. But life just has its own way of teaching you lessons and taking you different um, paths. And I um, wanted to play professional basketball. I had the honor to do so, and I'm grateful for it and played in Germany. And then decided this year, I really want to understand what it is to own your story. What does it mean to not sell a product, but how do you engage and build relationship? Similar to Mama Sigs, I love building relationships. I love connecting, like, that's the core in everything that I do. And I was brought up where serving is, if serving and purpose is not in what you do, why are we doing it in the first place? That's how I um, was poured into. So that brought me to a place of exploring, hey, how do I tell the story of others? Like, they're doing amazing work. How do we make the connection that now other people have an opportunity to experience this amazing work? which then brought me into doing more brand content and videography and photography. I consider what I do to really just experience what the person is already pouring. I just get to press a button, right? And it's such a blessing to be in spaces where you get to learn about people and engage with people. And then a lot of times I'm encouraged by the encounter when in a lot of cases, we go in thinking, oh, like I'm doing all of this for this person. And in reality, it's a beautiful exchange that happens. So entrepreneurship for me has not just been um, a blessing in terms of, as Gordon was saying, yeah, like you have your freedom of time. But everything that I've learned from the people that I've gotten to build and to serve has been what helps me to continue in my purpose. So I'm just grateful to you know, uh, as my one of my mentors always says, what part of this earth, what little bit of hole are you going to fill? And that's the part that I get to fill. Thank you. Hey, hey guys, again, my name is Ricardo. I think what drew me into entrepreneurship, I started a business. We started a business with my cousin, which is he was older than myself. And long story short, the business actually failed, and I lost 100, almost 100K, and came as well, almost 200, and that was the peak of my life. I was only 14. I remember I was 14, and I lost all that money. I did not tell my mom. I was like a year working really hard, like no sleep. But anyways, fast forward, that was really painful. So I was actually thinking about some stuff that I don't want to mention here anyways, because I was really in a bad place. 
um, fast forward, I decided to um, come here. And I had many people along the way who helped me. So that was always something that I always thought, like after college, what am I going to do? And after college, so I was like, let me start a podcast where I can help people, like, you know, who tell their story or entrepreneurship, just this, the little guy who is just starting because we don't have such thing. So, yeah. So that's why um, you guys see the Stars of the American podcast. And yeah, here we go. Here we are. Man, I'm really glad to be here today. Let's go, hey, guys. Yeah. Kiss, kiss. Uh, so, hi, guys. I'm Fiona. So, for me, Basically, I started because I wanted the freedom. I remember when I graduated here, I was basically taking biotech classes throughout because I thought I was going to work in a lab, and then I was going to go into forensics. That was the dream I had. But towards, like, the end, I believe I had, like, two semesters. I wasn't sure if that's what I really wanted to do. So I don't know where I decided to graduate with an uh, arts degree because then I was like, I don't even know what I want to do anymore because... The thought of being in a lab and being restricted at a job, I did not, I really wasn't sure. So I was like, you know what, if I get an arts degree, I can go back and figure out what I really want. So I got the arts degree and then I did get an internship for biotech through the school. And I started working and then a year into working, I got, into an, I got another lab job. And I remember being there and I was so miserable. This random girl liked this robe, and I got it from a thrift store for like $2.99. And I remember I had a coupon for 20% off because I returned something. And literally, the girl sends me a message. She's like, hey, I don't know if you remember me. We were both drunk in the bathroom. I would like to buy that dress that you had on, that wrap dress. And I was like, yeah. She's like, how much is it? I was like, how much do you, are you willing to pay? She said, well, I have $30. I said, well, I'll send you the different prints I have, and then you can buy it. I went to Walmart, bought a sewing machine. I cut up the, the, the robe. I started stitching it back together over and over again. And then I ran to anthropology and I bought one robe that was like almost $200. And I cut it up, I stitched it over and over and over again. And now I could do it without even having to follow the pattern. And then I went back to anthropology like a week later. I was like, I'd like to return this. And the lady was like, sure. I was like, do you see anything wrong? She's like, no. I kept on opening it, showing her the stitches. She said, no, nothing's wrong. I said, you know what, I'll keep it. Because me mentally, I'll tell myself, that's my university right there. I just went to sewing school. But I'll do that. So I ran to the fabric store. I bought so many different fabrics. And then I took pictures for her. I was like, what fabric would you like? So she picked a fabric, and then I made one for her. And then she sent me the money, and I made one. And then I said, would you like to try it on? We met at a, at a train station. She loved it. She said, hey, I have a photo shoot with my family in New York. I have a bunch of my sisters who like matching ones. Can you make them? I said, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> and mind you, I had never made anything before. That, like, before I could like, stitch something for myself, if something was broken, like, I would get like, a needle and make it. But that's how I really started. And then I remember going to work, and I remember this co-worker of mine, Nicole. I was like, Nicole, let's come up with business names. She was like, for what? I said, I think I wanna, I'm going to start a business. And she was like, Fiona, all we do is like pipettes in the lab. What? I said, we're going to start a business. She was like, no, we're not. And we are like literally sitting there make business things, but we, she had no idea what I was talking about. So I'm gonna make robes. She's like, no we're not. And I kept on thinking like, I need to get out of here because every day I was just losing my mind. Every time I look at my boss, I always remember the sandwich and every time she would eat, I would get triggered. <laughs> so that's how it started. And then I started making robes, like lacy robes. Anytime I'll find fabric, like my curtains, I'll take my curtains off and I'll cut them up. And my mom was like, why do you not have curtains in your house anymore? I was like, I'm making stuff. And I went to the, I'll go to the lab with my coworkers and they'll buy robes and I'll put them in their lockers and people will start paying me money. I'm like, how much do you have? And it looked weird because I have like little baggies put in, in people's lockers, but that's how it really started for me. And before you know it, I, I don't know where this lady fires me because I refuse to work Saturdays because I wasn't hired for Saturdays. I'm not going to pick it up because I have a kid. And that's how it picked up. And I don't know where I said, I did my first market sold out. People were like giving me random numbers. Like, I only have a hundred dollars. I'm like, that's fine, I'll take it. Cause I did not know anything about pricing. I did not know anything about business. So I'll be like, I have fifteen dollars. Like, I'll take it. I had no idea what I was doing. And then fast forward years later, pandemic hits, my business kind of goes down. Because the market's one day anymore. But I had these pillows in the living room. So before that, I had a birthday party coming up and my husband at that time was like, I'm not paying for your party and I needed pillows on the ground. I was like, I don't need your money. I can pay for my own party. I have like an impulse, but if I want something, I'll figure it out on my own. Like if you tell me no, I'll figure it out. 
I went on YouTube, I saw pillows. I was like, how do you make pillows? So I started sewing them up myself. I told myself I don't make them. I made like 50. The pandemic hit, now I have these pillows. And now I can't make robes anymore. And then now he's like, you need to get rid of those pillows out of the house. I put them on online. Overnight, someone purchased all the pillows. Yeah. I said, oh my God. So the lady comes back to me, she's like, hey, how many do you have? Like, well, do you have any other colors? I said, well, actually, no, I ended up causing her order because I offered free shipping and she was, she was in London. And I don't know where I was like, yeah, I have every color you can think of. How many do you need? I did not, I rent a fabric store, bought a velvet you can find. My husband actually is the one who drove me to every fabric store you can find in mass, bought all the velvet. And that's how the pillow business started also. I do not know how I can top that story. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But I will comment on Fiona's story. Um, I'm the boring banker, but, and by the way, I do have a small real estate company. So, so I, you know, it, it, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, I just want to comment on Fiona's story. Again, I am not a business owner like my six colleagues here, but again, I see a lot. And what Fiona's story really um, highlights, and sometimes people think of me as, you know, maybe the other guy on Shark Tank, evaluating businesses as they come and present uh, to a bank or a financier or an investor to support them. Fiona's story resonates for multiple reasons. And the most important reason was she was following the customer. The story about the robe or the story about the color or the story about, can I get one of those too? She didn't know that she was, but she was, following the customer. And I think that that's, that is, if, it, if I evaluating companies, talking to you all and, and, and collaborating with my um, panelists can in, uh, impart one, uh, one thought, it's follow the customer. Um, I'm going to recap a little bit. What I've heard is that people have gone in, and again, I'm not a business owner. People have gone into entrepreneurship for freedom or for independence, uh, maybe more bit more vacation time, um, make more money, um, make, make, spend more time with your family. Does that all resonate? Um, maybe I don't want to work for the man, um, that kind of thing, or um, maybe you're disgruntled with the company. But I, I'm going to push back a little bit on what some of my panelists had said. Being an entrepreneur is not easy. I, I know that my six panelists here do work 24 hours a day sometimes, and sometimes don't see their kids, and sometimes work on weekends, often work on weekends, and don't take vacation. So be aware that that's all part of being an entrepreneur. Um, so when you have choices being versus being an entrepreneur or going in a different path, the corporate path, Keep that in mind because it's not a layup, it's not a guarantee, and like I said, I support about 250 small business clients like the ones you see here. Most of them work until 7, 8, 9 p.m., weekends, Christmas, Thanksgiving. So don't be fooled about that part of entrepreneurship. There's, there's passion and there's follow the customer, but don't make no mistake that it is possibly even more hard work than what I do in working for a company. Mm -hmm. And I'll just add that. The next question, the next question that we have is what advice would you give to college students interested in starting their own businesses? Um, so you definitely want to be passionate about whatever it is that you are looking to start. Um, because it is a 24-7 job. And if you're not enjoying it and you're not enjoying, because you'll encounter clients or customers that are not ideal, but as long as you have like the passion behind it and you feel kind of like what Nikki was saying, you feel um, connected to what you're doing, you feel like it's giving back in whatever way you want to give back, um, that's what's gonna keep you going. There are many, like right now I'm, I have tons of emails that I need to respond to. And so I will probably be up until 10 o'clock, but that's because tomorrow I get to celebrate my mother and her birthday and take her out for dinner and 
hang out with my family and all of that stuff. So it's a lot of sacrifices. There are some benefits to it. So you do need to make sure that you're willing to make the sacrifice. And for that, you need to make sure that you're passionate about what you're doing, that you can feel it in your bones. Um, I just felt it in my bones. You know, like I said, I had kind of dabbled in entrepreneurial sh um, or entrepreneurship with the mortgage industry because I was in charge of bringing in my own business. But at the end of the day, like I was working long hours and I wasn't feeling fulfilled at the end of all of it. Um, honestly, the money would probably be better if I had stayed in the mortgage industry, but it just, at the end of the day, I felt drained instead of filled. And now, like, even if I am up until 10 o'clock, even if I am taking a call on a Saturday or a Sunday or doing something for one of my clients, I feel fulfilled at the end of the day. Um, and so that's what's worth it, and that's what keeps me moving forward. So that's my one piece of advice is just make sure that it is something. And take your time figuring it out. Like, what I love about community colleges is that it allows you the time to really think about what you want to do and dabble in a bunch of different things and say, all right, this is really where, where I feel I belong um, and not be paying the four-year <laughs> tuition and fees. Um, and I think it's very similar with entrepreneurship. Like, don't completely dive in until you know for sure that this is what you want to do. This is what you are feeling. Um, some may not agree with me, but that's the way I feel. So I'm going to piggyback on what Arif said in the last point. Mm -hmm. um, it is substantially more work than working a 9 to 5 or a corporate job. Um, just to give you a reference, I've had one day off this month. Um, I'm going to be up till 4 o'clock again. Every single day this week has been 4 a.m., mm -hmm. getting up at 9 a.m. Yeah. Um, I'm traveling to Philadelphia tomorrow at 8 a.m. So when you have your own business, it's substantially more work. And bearing on what it is, a lot more, right? I have two companies, so it's, you know, there's, weekends for me don't exist. Um, I've lost so many friends over the period of time, but that for me is okay, right? You have to understand that when you have your own business, it's going to be failure on top of failure on top of failure on top of failure. Mm -hmm. As Signe said, you have to be passionate about what you're doing because there's going to be so many days where you have no motivation. You don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to do what you're going to want to do. You may have to have a full-time job on top of your own business. So the biggest misconception is, or starting out, is don't think that this is going to work day one. Think this is going to work maybe year three, right? And if you don't think you can make it that far, don't, don't start, right? You can always do a side business that's not the same thing and do that to see if you like it. But realistically, I think, what is it? The average millionaire that has their own business is into their 40s. Um, you know, if you look at the statistics, people that succeed succeed later in life. It's not the 20 year olds, it's not the 30 year olds, it's usually late 30s, 40s, and sometimes even the 50s and 60s. Uh, don't think you're gonna become an overnight sensation because you did, what, two months worth of work? That's unrealistic. I would say embrace the L's. I know a lot of times we hear L's and we're like, oh shoot, she's telling me embrace the losses. Um, I do agree with Gordon. I think everything's perspective, right? What I mean by L's is like lessons and learning, right? Because there's so many lessons. There's never really a loss if you apply what you see as a loss as an opportunity to get back up and to learn from it, right? And then learning. For the first couple years, even though I recently launched in August, I wouldn't necessarily identify myself as an entrepreneur. I allowed myself to be under my mentor. My mentor has an advertising agency that does commercials for Coca-Cola and like Weston Hotel and so forth. And I allowed myself to be under him because I just wanted to learn the day by day. How does he make decisions? When he makes a mistake, how does he bounce back from it, right? A lot of times, and I agree with Gordon, is that we do 
um, have this idea because social media shows us when you're an entrepreneur, yeah, if you do this for 90 days, I promise you'll be a millionaire. And the reality is you're seeing <laughs> facts. You're seeing the highlights. And I'm not at all negating. There could be someone in here in 90 days. I promise you, kudos to you. And it's not impossible. So please don't leave here thinking it's impossible because your journey is yours. And I think the beauty in it is being on panels like this and, and being in front of people that are transparent about their hurdles is for you to then avoid that hurdle and go further than us. Because that's what we want you to do. Everything you learn from this conversation, please take it and apply it and go 10 steps ahead of us. Because that's the beauty in it, right? So like, allow yourself to be in conversations, ask those questions that are uncomfortable. I was on a call yesterday, and this is so horrible that I don't remember his name. But his last name is Gordon. And um, I know, I know, it's horrible, I'm sorry. We're still cool though. <laughs> We're still cool. And um, he's a well-known author, New York bestseller. And I was on the call, I'm like, wow, like he's talking really high level. And I don't know, like I kept looking up the dictionary. I'm like, I don't know this word. What's this man talking about? I had to go and read his bio. But it's great to be in those conversations because it reminds you there's always places that we can learn and expand and grow. And in the reality, that's where you really are able to take those steps. So like from any of us that are on this panel, you connect with someone, hey, can I grab a cup of coffee with you? I just wanna pick your brain. Hey, can I shadow you for the day? This is what I'm interested in. Let me just get a chance to see like, what are the, the good moments? What are the in-between moments? What are the hard moments and how do they respond? Doesn't necessarily mean you will do the same, but you're seeing the reality of what it is to be an entrepreneur. So I would say embrace the L's. All right, guys, uh, for me, I'll be very precise. So uh, I really agree with Nikki. Embrace the L's, and that's very, very true. I'll go back where I started about the business when I lost 100K, because that was something that hit me. I learned from that. That was really hard. So back in seminary, we learn about all these things, like letting things go, uh, do meditation, and things like that. But when you are facing failure, all that learning goes out the window. So it's all about really re resilient. And again, learning from people that are doing the same thing. They're in the same path. So I think that's pretty much it. So I read this. My last book was 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. I recommend you guys to check it out by Ami Mori. Actually, it's going to be on my podcast very soon, by next month. So you can, if you have some questions, you can send it to me, and I will make sure to ask that. You guys are going to really love that, that book. So I think that's pretty much it. And enjoy the journey and embrace the L's. That's all I can say. Because your journey is your journey, yours alone, and you just never know. Yeah. I think they have pretty much covered everything, but like, just find a great mentor because for me, um, there was an app I found and it was like, oh, this is, you know, you can find a mentor and I found one and he was like, not that great. He was basically like, everything discouraging me. Like, are you sure about this? Maybe like, you know, you should take you. Like he was basically discouraging me instead of kind of like, encouraging me to keep going. So every time like I'll have like a little hurdle, he would like, you know, maybe sometimes you need to just accept that things are not gonna go the right way. Instead of like kind of pushing me. So I just gotta know it and you know for me again, once you, someone tells me you can't do it, that's when I keep I keep going. Like for me once I'm like, okay bet. Okay, thank you. So for me, I just stopped taking his phone calls because I think he realized, okay, she's not taking my phone calls anymore, so I don't know why. And I remember one time he sent me a message. He's like, oh, did you finally stop doing the business? Did you finally go back to work? Because I think that's a great idea. And I was like, why would he tell me that? And mind you, I found him like, I think it was like a professional app where you find professionals to kind of like help you. And they say, okay, you're starting a business. You need to find a mentor. And he, I think he was in a bag too. He was a bank mentor, so that's, I met him in a bank in Lexington, but he was, he was a the wrong bank. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, so he was like a legit mentor in a bank, so I thought like he was going to be great, but for me it was like, 
he was discouraging me. So again, I try to surround myself with other um, business owners who were kind of like able to kind of like help me. And I think at that time, I signed up for marketing. It was like a Boston women's market, and there was these two young women who were also starting out. And every time I like, I was like, oh my God, I had a bad week. They were like, well, we had it too, so let's see what we can do. And he kind of like, we kind of kept on giving each other the boost. And that's what kind of kept me going. So even when I failed, I was like, well, next week might be better. So even to this day, when I have those failures, I just have to remember, why did I start? Because it's like, my son, I don't want him to always feel like, you know what, mommy failed. Like, I, I don't know, I always have that thing in my head because my son has my mouth, so I know he will shade me, and I don't want that. So <laughs> I, <laughs> I know how I am, so I always keep going because I know what I would, you know, I know what could come out of his mouth, so I just keep going. So if you're gonna start, just remember why you started. Yeah, I think Fiona had the wrong mentor. <laughs> but on that note, I, you know, a, a lot of my um, colleagues did mention having other people around them. And I, I think it's important to balance um, trying to do it alone versus having people around you. And not people who discourage you, but who give you constructive criticism. So in established companies, we talk about having a board of advisors. Um, but even in new companies, an informal board of advisors is, is kind of important, and I think that's what some of my um, colleagues mentioned. Again, not someone who discourages you, but who might give you constructive criticism. You don't want to have yes men around you at all times blowing hot air at you. Um, you, you want to um, know what your blind spots are. Um, and beyond that, I think that listening to some of the stories, I think they, there's a, a little bit of a distinction between just wanting to be a business owner, but wanting to fill something that the business community needs. Mm -hmm. They're making a product, they're, making a, they're, they're providing a service that they think they can do better than somebody else or the market needs or the local market needs or a customer needs. I think that's more important than the mindset of just, I just wanna be a business owner. It's, it's evaluating the need. And as you start, and I'm gonna put on a little bit of a banking hat here, um, get to know that business plan. Mm -hmm. That business plan, that SWOT analysis, um, understanding your market, understanding your product, how many widgets you need to sell, at what price you need to sell it at, and what expenses you have, is, is, is you may think about it informally, but as your business becomes a little bit more formal, as you're starting to thinking about launching it, that's a, that, that, the practice of putting together that business plan and actually then taking that business plan and putting it into numbers um, is very important. At the end of the day, this is a business and the business is supposed to make money. It's not a hobby, it's not something you wanna lose money at, it's, it's a business. That's ultimately what the, the goal is. So I would say having people around you that don't discourage you, but give you constructive criticism, and knowing your market and building a business plan are, are essential keys, and I think that's why they teach it. So what are some common misconceptions about entrepreneurship that you've encountered in your journey? I think there's kind of a misconception that when you're an entrepreneur, you're in charge of everything, and it's a lovely lifestyle, but um, it can be a very difficult lifestyle and uh, very demanding, especially when you're doing it all on your own and when, especially when you're first starting off um, and just failing and succeeding and failing and succeeding. Um, but yeah, I think we've touched on a lot of it, but that's one of the biggest ones. Um, I think I'll make this very quick. One of the biggest misconceptions is you will not succeed for a while, and you have to be comfortable with that. Yep. Um, people think you succeed instantly or the overnight sensation, but you probably won't get a big win for six months to a year. And obviously, as a life coach and a motivational speaker, I don't want to put anyone's hopes and dreams, crush them, but the reality is the reality. 
right? A lot of people go into entrepreneurship not knowing what they're doing and they get annihilated. Um, I'd rather you get annihilated before you start so you can make an educated decision of can I take this beating mm -hmm. and then go through it. Mm -hmm. I think Arif spoke to it beautifully um, earlier when you were talking about, you know, understanding what the need is. Uh, I think one of the misconceptions, at least me going into entrepreneurship, was whatever product or service, I mean, yeah, whatever product or service I'm starting, everybody's just going to jump on and they're just going to get it, right? Versus taking that time to identify what is that need and how am I looking to support that need? Um, and then the relationship aspect of it, because a lot of ways that I was taught entrepreneurship is that, you know, once you have your idea, everybody's just going to be like locked into it. Uh, but it's important to take the step back and realize, like, is this actually, like, impacting? Like, is it helping people? Like, am I going to um, support he or she or whatever that avatar is with my product or service? And it's so important to take that time to do that and realize what that is and then build from there. Because I remember I started off in marketing and I swore everybody was going to hit me up and I was ready to go. And then it failed. Because I realized, no, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't take the time to understand what my audience needed. Mm -hmm. So then I took the step back, and once I understood that, then, and the avatar meaning I know what the age range is, I know what community I'm looking to serve, I know what niche I'm looking to um, tap into, and I know exactly what that need is, right? Versus jumping in and saying, everybody's going to just lock into what I'm doing. So not forgetting, and Arif spoke to it perfectly, not forgetting who you are serving. And then it'll build from there. All right. Um, for me, I'm not going to be tapping dance around the truth. I'll go straight forward. So I wanted to talk a little bit about social media. Regarding social media, you see everyone is talking about successes, how they get what they got. I think someone here already tapped into that. But um, it's more about coming back to my podcast. I really wanted to show the truth behind every success mm -hmm. because nobody's showing their failures. Mm -hmm. So what I, I want to say is not getting fooled by what is going on, like what everybody's showing. It's like just because they told you, okay, it took me 10 months or two years, that's what you follow. Because behind the scenes actually takes a lot of work to succeed. And again, it's all about being resilient and coming again and again and again. So that's my piece of advice on that. The misconceptions about lifestyle, getting yeah. rich overnight, um, it, um, and you know the, the lifestyle of, of, of that versus the lifestyle of being a corporate employee, I think that's the biggest misconception. We're going to go to question nine. We're going to hop around a little bit okay. just from what our audience wants to hear. Okay. So uh, beyond access to loans, what other financial services offered by banks can be especially helpful for entrepreneurs in the growth stage of their businesses? The way that I run my portfolio as a banker is um, I have lots of connections with accountants, with attorneys, with, like I said, 250 other small businesses. So the institutions that you partner with, say for example, a bank or your accountant or your attorney, I think one of the things that um, they can offer you is almost like being a de facto advisor and a connector to other people that might be able to give you products and services that your business might need or introductions to markets where you might find more customers. Um, so um, I think that a, a good banker uh, or anybody you employ in your inner circle, um, beyond what service they provide, like of course I'm lending you a dollar to go invest in your business, is the connections and the market that they have access to. You haven't, you, you, remember the people that you're paying, you might be paying, and I'll, and I'll go through a few others. You might be paying a banker. They might have connections. You might be paying a website designer. They might have connections. You might be paying an accountant. They might have connections. 
as you develop your business and you start having to need services for your own business, make that person one of your connections as well. And there are some services that are free in, in at least Massachusetts. One is called SCORE. Don't ask me what that acronym stands for. But there's another one is called MSBDC. That stands for the Mass Small Business Development Council. And banks pay into these organizations. And what the, the goal of these organizations that partner with banks is to help startup entrepreneurs. They help startup entrepreneurs build a business plan to build a projection P&L or to build a projection balance sheet and maybe even build a package so that they can then go take that package back to the bank to be in a better position to get a loan. And the, the volunteers who work at SCORE and MSBDC are for the most part retired small business owners on the retirement side of their life who have run small businesses for 30, 40, 50 years and now are in that mentality where they wanna give back to the business community and help young entrepreneurs gain the success that they have. So there are actually free services, and banks typically know this because at the end of the day, banks want to get something from, there, there's, a, there's a packet that they provide that banks can use to help evaluate a business. Um, and so at, as you, um, and by the way, it, it holds for um, entrepreneurs that are established too. Um, SCORE and MSBDC are two uh, resources here in Massachusetts that are free of charge. And like I said, it's they're again, I don't want to overuse the term mentor, but they can help you um, almost in an accounting or um, strategic way. Exactly. Yeah, I believe all this information, both information, uh, pretty much, I don't want to be repetitive. I believe that the relationship with the bank, I think it's really important. And I definitely agree with what Arif said here. So, um, ask them. Yeah, I um, agree as well. I think in addition, um, there are also credit unions that are really good in terms of providing support. Like, I know that the Boston Credit Union, for instance, in Boston, um, they have a good relationship in terms of understanding the different grants that are available in the city of Boston. And that might be something to look into as well, just so you understand the language of maybe I'm not applying for that grant right now, but as I'm looking at my business plan, going back to what Marie said, when you're looking at your business plan and you're putting those different pieces in place, what's the language and what's the focus that I want to even develop at an early stage? So when I go and apply for different grants, um, I'm, cohesive. I'm going to pass on this question because I actually don't use banks for my company. It is, for the most part, all self-funded. But... Same with me. I don't. I, I probably should start tapping into some stuff, but right now everything is just coming out of my pocket. Um, but, I'll, but I'll add this for um, Gordon and, and Sydney. Even though you may not be a loan customer, you're still a deposit customer. True. Mm -hmm. So true. you are a customer of a bank, even though you are not a borrower. Okay. That's fair. That bank should provide you with uh, right. equal mm -hmm. services. Right. So, so in the, that that brings up a point. Choose a choose a banker, not a bank, mm -hmm. this or so. Um, and just like you choose any of your vendors, website designer or mm -hmm. marketing company, accountant, anything. It's it's the one-on-one -on -one connection, the personal connection that will always serve the entrepreneur better in my company. So we're gonna quick one ends with it. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, Arif's gonna be my banker. And I just wanna point out that all of us on the panel were taking notes during Arif, while Arif was talking. Like this is, but this is like the entrepreneurial spirit right here is that we're not, you know, I'm sure you guys are taking notes too, but we're all looking for our next step yeah. in taking in what resources we can learn from each other. Um, I do want to just echo again, like the network piece of it and the fact that you said, you know, you have a lot of businesses in your portfolio and making connections between industries. And my business in particular is very much referral based. And so the people that I, the website developer that I work with on another team has sent me tons of people. Another client of mine has sent me tons of referrals. So it is all about 
your network, your connections, and also like looking out for each other. So that's not really a financial resource, but you touched upon it, so I brought it up. <laughs> Can you share one of your biggest failures in business and how you bounced back from it? Okay, so I wasn't completely honest about the <laughs> the mortgage business. I did, I had started the seedlings of my business. I already had a couple of clients that I was working with on a regular basis. So I had started the seedlings of my business, but I actually got laid off from the mortgage business because I don't know there anybody, fo I know you do, but I don't know there anybody follows real estate, but interest rates went from like 2% up to, Eight. yeah, 8%. Um, and because I didn't have strong enough relationships because people were slimy. Um, I didn't have the business or I didn't have the book of business to keep my position at the mortgage industry or the mortgage company. So that was my biggest failure and a real gut punch, but it was also like redefining what I'm passionate about. And I was like, you know that you weren't happy there. So why do you care? Like find a way to make this work. So, um, in many ways, that failure, I mean, I'm just about a year into this new business and I'm already doing so much better with this than I did three years in the mortgage industry. So um, although it was the biggest failure and it was just kind of like you just sit there and question yourself and say, am I made for this? It also reignited my passion for what I was doing and doing it my way and not having anybody else in charge of like whether I was working or not. So um that was probably my biggest failure. <laughs> Ooh, so one of my biggest business failures is bouncing back from three failed businesses. That took, oh, say, seven plus years um, to recover from that mentally, to be able to say, okay, screw this, I wanna keep going, was massive. Um, obviously, it's not for everyone, right? And I, trying to put that position of like, takes a lot of mental determination, resilience, and discipline um, to become an entrepreneur and to become someone successful on top of that. But yeah, that's the biggest business failure is bouncing back from three and now creating two successful companies that are both profitable. I'm sorry. <laughs> I would say uh, my biggest failure is um, when I started my marketing company, it just completely like, I just, I, it didn't hit at all. Um, <laughs> from learning the concept of it to trying to execute it to thinking that I can do it all by myself, it just didn't work out at all, right? It was a, a blessing where like there were a lot of referrals, but then I got overwhelmed and I just like, and then I didn't love it anymore. And I think that's so important going back to what we mentioned earlier that like whatever area and arena you decide to pursue entrepreneurship, make sure you love it. Um, th that doesn't mean there aren't going to be some days that you're like, this is, this is different, you know, but there's still that desire to want to be in it. So you keep going. And I think that I didn't love marketing enough to want to continue to pursue it. And I also think one of the things that I'm learning actively now is that it's so important to ask for help. I think one of the things that part of being a, a solopreneur when you're starting is like, you're understanding your systems, you're putting everything in place. But then when it starts to scale like videography, once you start getting clients and branding, once it happens, it happens quick, right? And, and you build that momentum. And if you don't ask for help or you begin to put systems in place, as uh, mama was saying earlier is that, I mean, excuse me, Signy was saying earlier, <laughs> is that if you don't put um, structure into your business, it can also fail very quickly because you didn't think ahead. You're kind of just like building a bike and trying to ride it at the same time. So I think actively that's something that I'm learning from my marketing business that failed and actively now looking at how do I think ahead and not be impulsive in the moment. So that's so important that sometimes you might feel like, dad, maybe I'm thinking too far ahead. Maybe I have to put the structure and all this stuff in place. And it is good to do that. 
but take a step back and think about what's the long term of where you see it going and be more proactive and ask for help and seek help where I've spoken to Signe and I'm like, hey, like I might need some project help because this is getting a little bit too much. And I am so pressed in on making sure that every experience from start to finish is a good experience. Cause my Angelo says people will always remember how you made them feel. And I don't believe in serving clients where I'm just taking your money and going. Like it's an ongoing relationship, whether it's for one moment, whether it is continuous, whether it is for just a season. So that's that's so important in terms of even reflecting on, on failures. And that was some of mine. Um, hmm. For me again, uh, I'm just gonna go have to go back to when I was 14 years old again. <laughs> that was the biggest failure. Guys, don't laugh, but it's true. <laughs> So um, bouncing back from that really hard. So I was, I'm going to say, I think when I was trying to bounce back, it was so, so hard that I promised myself, if I can come back from this, mm -hmm. everything that I'm going to start or I'm going to do, I'm going to have to love it. I'm going to have to have a passion. And whatever that comes as a failure, I don't see things as a failure, but I see it as lesson. If I don't accomplish something, I just see it as lesson and I try to bounce back as fast as possible. So my piece of advice, I would say, whenever you encounter a failure, whatever you call it, try to bounce back as fast as possible. Like, especially for you, like if you're in your twenties, thirties, whatever the case may be, whatever age is, try to go, you know, just bounce back as fast. Don't dwell on a, on, on a failure, but you know, what is the next step? Just looking ahead and get surrounded with people, again, that are in that same path as you. And that's my piece of advice on that. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's still happening right now. I haven't bounced yet. I'm waiting for the bounce to start happening because, so for me, with my pillow business, I, I believe like last year, that, two years ago, that's when I started getting into stores. So finally, I'm making my way into major stores, and I've been really excited. And now finally, I got, I got a big store. We did a test uh, in person with a big pop-up by myself, and it was really successful. So finally, we're like, okay, perfect. Now we're going to put you in the store or online. We're going to go. And I said, perfect. But then as we're in the process of unload, uh, onboarding and everything, I was about to have a baby, so I had to go on maternity leave. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to go on maternity leave. So with the buyer that I work with, it's just one person. We've been communicating back and forth. And I'm like, once I get back on maternity leave, we can complete the whole process. So now that I'm back, I reached out to her and I'm like, hey, I'm ready to onboard now. And she's nowhere. I didn't all the time. And then I tried to reach out to somebody else. I was like, hey, I'm looking for Bianca. I was supposed to start the onboarding process. She's like, who are you? What are you looking for? And I was like, well, I did a test day in the store and it was a huge success and I sold out and it was amazing. And I'm supposed to be doing the onboarding. So I even had to take screenshots of the emails, I forwarded everything. And she was like, well, we had no idea. And I was like, well, I was in your store. I was plastered everywhere. Here's pictures. You can go to my website. And she was like, well, we had no idea. I'm like, so I think like the buyers changed. So they had no idea. So and Bianca never got a chance to forward anything. So, and the lady who's now in that process literally is acting like, she's like, she doesn't see the emails. It's like, she's blind to everything I'm like showing her. She's like, so now it's like, I'm trying to like, the last two months we've been going back and forth and she's really acting like she doesn't see anything. So I'm not even bouncing at this point. I'm just, it's just like the disappointment because it's like, I, it took me like over a year back and forth to finally make that connection to make those phone calls, to make those emails. And I was really, really excited because for me it was like a huge store and it was really hard getting in. Cause with all the stores that I've got in, I've done that by myself. And with this one, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna take off. I'm finally gonna hit my million a year. This was my million dollar year. <laughs> and this lady, she was next to the So I'm not even bouncing at this point. So I don't know how I'm gonna go through this process. So 
We're just going to wait for another storm, maybe. So I will not be bouncing anytime soon. Stop <laughs> that. I will not be bouncing. She's a bad on us. Well, I'll, I'll bet on you. Um, we bet on you for sure. Bet on us. Um, so I've had, again, I'm not a, I keep repeating this, I'm not a business owner, um, but I've had so many business failures <laughs> and personal failures, you can't even count. But I will say this about things that have happened in my career um, that resonate, maybe resonate with entrepreneurs. And um, that is, um, I had to, it, I had some failures in the early part of my career because I did not know how to communicate. I did not know how to sell. And, and what I mean by that is I did not know how to listen to my customer. And there's a seven, there's a rule called the 70, 30 rule that I employ in my life, every single meeting, except maybe this one, um, <laughs> where if you listen 30, if you talk 30% and you listen 70%, that means the customer's interested in what you want to sell. Um, so let the customer do the talking. And when I sort of employed that, that, that listening skill, that, that understanding, I want to sell to solve the customer's problem, not to meet some need that I have, is when I started seeing success, I started seeing connections, I started, my phone started ringing, um, professionals of far greater experience started reaching out to me. So um, that's one thing that, um, uh, maybe a tidbit from my, my career path that you can take away. Um, I will add, this about um, about failure in in entrepreneurship that I see. Um, sometimes I see as businesses start to get successful and start to monetize means start to make money um, that it's euphoric and now you can start taking money out of the company. Remember, this company has to go on for for longer than that short period of time. So it, as companies get successful, be leery of putting too much money back into your pocket. That doesn't mean that I don't want you all to be successful or wealthy, but when you be extravagant and don't leave anything in the company and, le and leave the company's success to the next quarter, the next year, the next sale, then you're not leaving yourself a cushion. And the company will have expenses, payroll, vendors, supplies, and things like that. So if you can, if you can be a little conservative, especially at the beginning, remember those goals that you set in that business plan and be a little conser conservative. Again, that doesn't mean take, pay yourself, but if you can be a little conservative, especially at the beginning, you might save yourself a lot of headache towards the end. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing I'll add is, um, there's this notion of working in the business instead of working on the business, working on the business, I think. I use Fiona's example, for example. If she's going to spend all her time stitching and all that, that's one. Th that's wonderful. But it might, what she's better off doing is trying to find those partners. Who are those partners? Are they in the fashion industry? Are they in the home industry? Are they realtors? Are they stagers? Are they decorators? Are they retailers? That's called working on the business instead of just grinding in the business. So that strategic thinking of, of, of working on the business w is something that I think entrepreneurs should do. And, and the most successful entrepreneurs have that idea, that high level idea but, or, or mindset. And that's, that's all I'll add to that. This video to pass you back. No. The first the story. So. It was exactly now. I know. <laughs> so now we are. Uh, moving on to just our attendee Q and A portion, but I just wanted to, you know, give everybody a chance to just applaud our panelists. You guys have done such an amazing job, and I also want to shout out our alumni again who are on the panel. So just to give a little reminder, if you just sort of like raise your hand or wave and say hello. <laughs> so don't forget us. <laughs> when you've moved on to your next adventure because I want to have you guys be on a panel and connect with future students and future community members so it's a full circle. So, yeah, so, and out of everybody here, this group that's left are, 
exactly who I had in mind when getting this group together. Uh, honestly, like, yeah, I heard about your great idea the other day. You're a president of a CE of a brand new club called the CEOs Club, and then. I don't even know what you're doing, Joelle, but I know that you're going to be doing amazing things. And I know all of you that are left have great things that you're working on. So this is your time to ask questions. I have a few questions, actually. Um, to start a business, right, um, I know you have to get, like, certifications and stuff like that. Um, I live in New Hampshire, but uh, I would like to start a business in Massachusetts. I want to start a tech company, but I don't know exactly what do I have to do. Do I have to save money? at first to start a business or would it be a better option to get a small business loan? I don't know. Um, I guess my question really is to uh, Mr. Yeah. Arif. Yeah. What's his name? To Mr. Arif. <laughs> sorry. Hey, hey. My bad. I'm so sorry. Hey. So you asked about getting a loan first. Yes. A bank or any kind of financier is not going to give you a loan unless you have an idea. An idea. So there's no such thing as walking around money that a bank yeah, is yeah. going to give you to, to here, go take a loan. And I mean, you could take a personal loan for that, mm. but a bank is going to lend money when you have a s specific need at that point. And, and I have identified a specific business. So the loan is kind of secondary to identifying what kind of business you're going to be running, who your market is going to be what your product is going to be, all of that kind of thing. Does that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what kind of, I know, is it, do you start a business with a LLC? Is that correct? So here's the thing, right? So if you want all that stuff and you try to figure it out, right? Yes. There's like an app you can go to and someone can be able to help you with that. It's like a, either you go to Upwork or Fiverr. You can see, try to start a business and you can find someone who can help you figure it out. Go to your town hall. Because for me, what I did, since I had no idea what I was doing, mm -hmm. go to your town hall, tell them you want to start a business. Literally, someone in there is always going to help you tell you. They're going to give you a list and be like, this is what you need. You need a business certificate. You'll be like, hey, I want to open up a bank. They're going to tell you a business certificate. That They'll literally write everything down for you before you come to him. Because when you come to him, mm -hmm. he's going to look at you crazy and probably send you away. <laughs> so go on, write down everything they need. They'll tell you the fees of how much you need. Usually, it's like 25 bucks, 35 bucks, right? The little certificates they need. Yeah. Yeah, all those little things first before you come to them because they will send you away. And once you get those little things, if you cannot, and then when, when it comes to LLCs, you might not need them, but since it's a tech company, it's different from me. Go on Fiverr, find somebody, or you can find me on Instagram. I can literally send you the lady. And she was very, she, she tried me barely like 150, which is very low to get an LLC. She will ask you all the information you need. She will do everything for you, buy the book with, you know, whatever state you're in where you want to open it. Once you get all those things together, get your business plan together, then find him. Mm, okay. My other question is, uh, I'm sorry if I'm taking all home. Was there any, like, uh, regulations or anything you have to follow when it comes to the law as, like, your businesses or what um, exactly, what is the process once you have an idea and you fill out your LLC and what, what is, like, the next step for you guys? Like, what my question is, what did you guys do after keep continuing to grow your business? Whatever your idea is, mm -hmm. just write it down and then go through it with a mentor. Then they can help you figure that out because what he does is finance and banking. Mm -hmm. What I do is home decor of fashion. So whatever your idea is, we might not be able to like kind of help you. Like again, he said you need to have a business plan, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever your business plan, you need to write that down and then go through it with like um, is it a life, co life coach. But then you, you need a business coach. <laughs> Sorry, can, can you hear me? You need like a, a business coach, right? You need to find a business coach. So write down the plan you have because all those LLCs and everything will not matter until you have a business plan. Mm -hmm. Like you can get all that, but if you don't have a business plan and the next steps that you need, that will not matter to anybody. Like no one will take you serious. So write it down, find a business coach. Again, you have, so at work or Fiverr, or even try to find a friend or someone in college. I think the college might have something like that. Find a business coach, tell them what your plan is, give it to them, or go on, go on YouTube. I went on YouTube for everything. And then write down your business plan, find a business coach, 
let them go through everything with you. Once you feel like that business plan could work, before you go put our money on LLCs and all that, because those things cost money. It's like right. $800, I think, a year or something, even before that. There is so much money that you're going to spend, and you don't want to spend that until like you know exactly what you want to do or if it's even going to make you money because you don't want to go through all this money, and then you just abandon it. Because I had a girl come to me recently. She was like, I have this plan, da, 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 da. and she told me, and I was like, where's your business plan? What do you want to do? Do you, as you said earlier, you need to like know the market and the people you're going to serve and like you need to know all that stuff so write everything down and know who is it going to serve how like everything mm -hmm. take it to a business coach once you go through it and you know you're sure because you will going to go spend your money on that llc like this girl did after i told her not to spend money on the llc's and she did and now she was there crying about all this money she wasted and lost and i was like honey you only lost almost two thousand mm -hmm. dollars people have lost almost 200k 100k so write that down you can come to her. She's like an entrepreneurship. She's like, and yeah, she's oh, over yeah. there. I mean, both of them. You can come to them both. It's been a long time, but I, but I mean, but again, you can come to her and bring it to her because she's right there. See, we didn't have this when I was here. I don't remember having this. Bring it to her, show it to her first, and then find a business coach. Try to go to a bank and see if they have like an advisor. Again, he said like they have MSB, this, yeah. Go to that because it's free. And then show it to them and see what they tell you. Don't go buying the LLCs and doing all that stuff first. So make and, a plan first. Yeah, make the plan first before you go pray for any of this stuff because you're going to waste your money. Okay. I would say be very careful with picking the business coach if you go into business. I've encountered a bot. They charge a lot. It was just a lot of fluff. So kind of similar. Yeah. Same, like find somebody who's going to give you constructive criticism, not tear you down. Should be that. Um, but there's a lot of people that put on this facade is like, oh, I'm going to change your life, I'm going to change your business yes. to your reset. Okay. But MSVDC, that's yeah. why he said. <laughs> no, I think what Fiona's saying is whether or not your business is selling hamburgers or financial products or um, major manufacturing components to Apple, first you have to decide what your business is. Right. The LLC is simply a legal entity that allows you to file documents on that business, take loans on that business, have that business recorded with the state. But that doesn't, that's not what your business is. That's just the legal aspect of your mm -hmm. business. But your business is really, what is it that you're selling and who is it that you're selling to? That's the first important part of the journey, I think. Okay, okay. thank you so much. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's uh, that's all my questions. I don't, I don't know. Hi guys, thank you so much for all the information. Uh, my name is Joseph Okri. I'm an international student here from Albania. I have a background in venture capital in Europe, and now I work in finance here. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how do you guys raise traction, and what are the ways that you use to network for your business, and um, in what stage do you see your business to be in the next five years? So how do I gain traction? By doing events. Um, we'll start with the Edibles Company. Um, one of the biggest things is events, right? Sales. I have a, it's me and my dad. My dad used to work on Wall Street. He's aggressive beyond belief. <laughs> um, and you have me who uh, I have to live up to his shadow. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you have two people that are doing it. And my mom as well, who's um, a nurse and whatever. She's been in the ER, all that stuff. Uh, three people that are extremely aggressive. And you got to be. Like for, for you to have any succession, you have to get it. You have to create opportunities, right? Opportunities are not gonna be in front of you. You have to force them there. You have to, because a lot of the times when you're starting out, the mentors that you may want, they don't wanna listen to you. You may have to reach out to them 20 times. You may have to reach out to them 30 times. Um, and I guess, where do I see this business in five years? In 20 different states. Um, edibles in 20 states, potentially in Canada as well. Um. Where I see, uh, for me, I don't have a time frame, but um, as long as I can help as many people as possible, I think that's my goal. Nice uh, presentation from you guys. Like, I really loved how you guys uh, express all your story as an entrepreneur, as a as business people. Uh, I'm, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur and consider myself that, so it's a pretty valuable opportunity for me to come here as an international student to learn from professionals in the field. 
So we did talk a, talk a lot about networking, uh, marketing, demand, in, uh, client, all of those people. But the main important thing for me is that I want to build a team around me that can help me uh, succeed and, and set up a basic foundation that can actually last in a long-term project. How, do you guys, how did you guys build a solid team that helped you realize your goals and, and succeed in that kind of vision? Uh, yeah, so I, obviously I have multiple people. My parents are the biggest ones that help, um, but I do have a lot of other people, friends, family, all this. One of the biggest things is when you were saying how to help me succeed, that's the, in my opinion, that's the incorrect way of saying it, right? It's how do we succeed? Mm -hmm. Because once you put yourself as an I or as an individual, yeah. game over, right? Like you're limited, I could run you over. Like to be completely honest, because you're isolating yourself from the rest of your team. I see that as blood in the water. Um, the, they, again, it's always a team thing as first off, we are going to. Number two, you have to weed out a lot of people and you have to be comfortable saying no to people. It could be your friends, it could be your family, it could be your parents, it could be your sisters. I've had family work with me and I said, we're here never doing this again. <laughs> it's, it's honest and I've had friends the same way. Yeah. And I, I literally have friends, can I work with you? I'm like, look, we can be friends, we'll never work. And I have some people that I would never be friends with that are some of the best people to work with. So you never know, but it's a trial and error and you have to see what characteristics, what qualities, what traits that you're looking for and then people that can mesh together. Because let me give you a good example. Um, uh, what is Westbrook, Brian Westbrook, or what is it, Russell Westbrook? Mm -hmm. He's never won anything, right? And a phenomenal player, triple doubles, MVP, all that stuff. But Robert Horry has seven rings, <laughs> right? I, it's just, do you, do you want to win or do you want to get trophy? Do you want to be an MVP or do you want to have these rings, right? Everyone wants to be Robert Horry. No one wants to be yeah. Russ. I want to be Russell Westbrook. I mean, <laughs> pe people do. I, obviously, people do. But like, yeah. realistically, you want to be the Robert Horry of the world. So yeah. that's, you got to, especially nowadays where everyone thinks of the I, 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 how do I get famous? How do I push myself? How do I do social media? You have to kind of say, okay, great that's there, but what's really successful? What is, what is going to be long-term and what is going to keep you going? I do have something. Yeah, go for it. So although I don't have a team myself, I am brought into a lot of people's teams, and one in particular, we have had to go through a lot of um, trial and error. And we, she was looking for a marketing person, and somebody came into the office <laughs> And literally the second they left the office, me and the other team member were like, absolutely not. This is not going to work. Um, and it was that there just wasn't a good energy. There wasn't a good, um, they just clearly weren't going to be a good member of the team. So you really do, I would say, as you build a team, make sure that you take into account the other team members' opinions too, and not just kind of going with the we, not I. Like, although you may be the owner of the business, giving the respect to the other team members who have been there by your side, helped you scale up your business, taking their opinions into account and having that dictate who you're bringing on to the team is really important too. I, I, I want to echo what um, Gord, Gordon yeah, said. Gord. Um, he makes a very, very important point, I, and I just want to emphasize it. There are three ways you can build a team. One is to hire people and pay them because they're a vendor of yours, right? So you can hire a marketing a individual, a, a coach, but you, but you have to pay them. You can also make people your employee, but you have to pay them. If you're looking to build, if you have not started making money yet in your business and you're looking to build a team, those are, like Gordon said, your invest they're investors with you. So they have to be incented to go without for a while, just like you are planning to. So their incentive could be that they want a piece of the ownership of the company, like a payday at the end, just like you. So I just want to emphasize that Gordon makes a very, very strong point that it's, you, you can't just say work, work with me unless you're going to pay them 
or give them a piece of your business in terms of some sort of ownership, which may have no value at the beginning, but you're starting it because you're hoping to build value. So I just wanted to make that point. I just have one more question for uh, Mrs. Uh, Fiona. How, how were you able to get your products into those, those big brands like Walmart or? I nagged the heck out of them. Let me tell you, I'm one person about like, I will call you, I will email you, I will pull up in the store. Even if you tell me no, just because you told me no, it doesn't mean you're not gonna tell me yes tomorrow. So like you tell me no today, but tomorrow you might be in a good mood. So I will call you until you tell me stop calling my phone. Then I'll stop. <laughs> Until you told me stop. You told me no on the phone, but you didn't tell me no in the email. So for me, <laughs> so until you told me no on every avenue, and then there's LinkedIn. So you tell me no. <laughs> so I'm like a little business stalker. So I will keep, <laughs> because I want my business out there. I feel like as if it's like, until you tell me no everywhere, because maybe you just forgot. Like maybe you did not look at my business. Like. Well, I remember the first time like I reached out to like Nordstrom, right? I had been trying for years, crickets, no response. And then one time I called, mind you I've been calling, I will miss a month. And I get keep on getting bounced around, bounced around, and I'm calling different Nordstroms. And then this one time I made that phone call and the gentleman, I was like, may I please speak to the general manager? And they, they, somehow they connected me to him this time. I said, my name is Fiona, I have a pillow company, I would love to do a pop-up in your store. He said, sure, what would you love to do? I was like, you know, like when you pause and you're like, I still could not believe that. He said, sure, when? I have been emailing, calling, texting, like everybody that says like manager, supervisor for years. No, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. This one phone call randomly when I wasn't even, at this point, like I was literally doing it as I'm eating cereal, like not even on the computer being businessy. Like it was just in my pajamas, like not even being serious. <laughs> and he says, sure, when would you like to come in? I was like, next month. He said, yeah, okay, here's an email, send me the, your website, and he looks like, yeah, oh my God, they're gorgeous. Okay, let's set our plan, and I showed up, and it went amazing. And I remember when I got in there, they had like a, and the funny thing is like the day before, I ended up really, I was like on my kid's uh, school trip, and I got so sick, I almost passed out of the school museum with a bunch of little kids running around. I ended up in the ER, they were like, we're gonna hold you, you cannot leave you, you have a sister you're about to, if you leave, you're gonna die. I said, let me tell you, I will die in those from I'm not staying here. And the nurse was like, you're gonna have to sign a form because we cannot let you, I had tubes. I'm like, three in the morning, pull them out, I'm calling my friend, Nina, Nina, me, me, I know she's like, Fiona, you cannot leave that house. And my husband is like, you know, she's crazy, she's not leaving. I drove home. Packed up my car, Nina showed up with her husband. I'm loading up my car. You know I can't move because like literally, I, they were like, you know, you need surgery. I showed up at Nostrum. I'm like standing up straight like I'm in pain. And they, they give me a microphone. They said, introduce yourself, the whole store. I did not know they had a whole setup for me. And I'm introducing myself, but I'm in a lot of pain. And I did that pop up and I sold out. And I had a great time in pain. But that was like the best thing because I could not believe that one phone call after years of no, someone said yes. Even like, so it's like you just have to keep going because someone is gonna randomly say yes. Even like with West Elm, I had been trying for years. It was like, no one will get back to me. And then randomly I get an email and I was like, mm, probably a prank, I ignored it. Because I'm like, ain't no way they reaching out to me after me trying for years. And then they sent me another email. And I was like, so then I said, you know I tell my husband, I said, hey, can you look up this lady? Because I feel like it's a scam. He's like, Fiona, he's legit. The lady is like on LinkedIn, that's her job. She's reaching out to you, so you know how to call. And then she said her name, then I hang up. I was like, mm-mm, I hang up. So then I called back, I said, sorry, my network is bad. You know, I'm sorry, you know. And she's like, yeah, would you love to come in? And ever since then, now two years later, and that's how I think I met Caroline, who brought me in mass, she was like, she was like, we would love for you to do a pop-up. You can come whenever you want in the store. You can set up half of the store is yours. Do what you need to do. Put your pillows there whenever you want to. And that's how the partnership with West Elm started. So just keep going and you don't know who's gonna say yes. Don't take that no as a no. That's how I feel. Because the banks can tell you no, they're gonna softly let you tell you no, but just keep going. Don't say, cause they tell you no on the phone, but the email is different and LinkedIn is different. Cause you know, different. Sometimes people just, people just have a different, a bad day today. They won't have a bad day tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. People have a bad day today, but not a bad day tomorrow. They might be on vacation when they give you that yes. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much, guys.